Welcome to the theoretical computer science seminar at the Adelonian. Today we have Jonathan Armoni. Uh, he did his PhD in uh, Université de Bordeaux. And he's working on graph colorings, graph reconfiguration. In particular, he was working on Bising's conjecture on reachability of optimal uh, edge coloring via Kempe changes. And uh, Jonathan is going to show us the proof of the conjecture. Thank you, Bartek. Just a small question before starting. I have this kind of message here. Should I say something like Ro Rosumian? Okay, thank you. So thank you, Bartek, for the introduction and thank you everyone for uh, attending this talk. So as Bartek said, uh, today I'm gonna talk about the Bezin's uh, conjecture, which is a conjecture about edge coloring and edge coloring reconfiguration. And so this is a question I've been working on during most of my PhD, let's say. So in this talk, I will be talking about uh, KH coloring. So KH coloring is just a coloring of the edges of your graph such that you don't have uh, two adjacent edges which get the same color. So during all the talk, I will only consider these kind of proper edge colorings where all the edges, uh, all the adjacent edges have a uh, different color. And what we are usually looking for when we are considering coloring questions is the minimum number of colors that you need to color the edges of your graph. So for an edge coloring this uh, parameter, the minimum number of colors needed is called the chromatic index. And it's um, denoted by a chi prime of G. And contrary to vertex coloring in uh, edge coloring, you have a very, let's say, a trivial, simple lower bound for the chromatic index of your graph is that you need at least a delta of G colors to color the edges of your graph, where delta of G is the maximum degree of your graph. Because if you have a vertex of degree delta, you will need at least delta color to uh, color the edges around this vertex. So we need at least delta colors. Um, one of the first theorem on uh, edge coloring that we have is a Vizing theorem. So it was published in 64, but the paper in 64, I think, is in Russian. So I don't have uh, read it, uh, the, the paper itself, but the proof is really nice. And actually, Bezing proved that in, in the worst case, you need uh, at most one additional color to color the edges of your graph. So to color, to properly color your graph, you need either delta of G color or either delta of G plus one colors. And just uh, some word about the complexity of uh, computing this uh, chromatic index. It's actually NP hard uh, to compute it, uh, even for uh, supercubic graphs. So it was proved in uh, 81. And what this improved uh, just one year later is that uh, his theorem holds also for multigraphs. So if I take a multigraph and I want to color the edges of my multigraph with the same constraint, uh, which is the two edges, two adjacent edges don't get the same color, then I just have to uh, add uh, mu of g, which is the multiplicity of my multigraph. The multiplicity is just the maximum number of edges that you can have between two vertices. So in the case of a simple graph, the multiplicity of your simple graph is one. And if you have a multigraph of multiplicity mu of g, uh, you need at most some delta of G plus mu of G colors to color the edges of your graph. So this is what we have about the, the bounds on uh, edge coloring. And um, actually the key ingredient of this proof and the key concept that I will uh, talk about during this talk is uh, campus swaps. So campus swaps was initially invented by Alfred Kempe in the 19th century. It was invented for vertex coloring, but the principle remains the same for edge coloring. Uh, actually, he invented this uh, kind of tool to prove the four color theorem, which states that if you have a planar graph, you only need four colors to color the vertices of your graph. And so he invented his tool, uh, this tool, which I will uh, present in the next slide. But what is this really interesting about this tool? So the first thing is that uh, his proof was false for the four color theorem, but uh, his tool, the Kempe chains and the Kempe swaps 
uh, became a very fruitful tool in uh, graph coloring and it is largely used uh, it's a very standard proof technique to, to, to prove, uh, for example, bounds on the number of colors that you need. And this uh, tool is uh, based on the simple idea is that when we will be coloring a graph, at some point, we'll have to, so you, you want to color your graph, you will start by uh, coloring them vertex after vertex. And then at some point, we'll need somehow to backtrack in, the sense that you will have to change the color of some vertices to make this color available for his neighbor. So this idea of uh, Kempe is really uh, an idea of reconfiguration. At some point, you will just reconfiguring your coloring into another coloring so that you will have an available color for some, ver some vertex that you want to, to color. So what about uh, edge coloring uh, this time? So actually what this proved is that using KMP swaps, if you start from any K edge coloring of your graph, then you can reach a delta plus one edge coloring of your graph. So this is what this uh, statement says. So being equivalent to a delta plus one edge coloring means that you have a sequence of Kempe swaps that you can do to transform your K edge coloring into a delta plus one edge coloring. So what we didn't prove is that um, to prove that you only need delta plus one colors, he proves that, oh, perfect. thank you. Mm. So yes, to prove that you can reach a delta plus one, to prove that there is a delta plus one edge coloring, he proved that you start from a cage coloring and you just transform it until you reach a delta plus one edge coloring. So you will just somehow delete some color classes one after the other in the process. And this is how uh, his proof uh, works. So here on edge coloring, we'll see that uh, campus swaps are really, let's say, uh, much more tractable too. I can also do this. Oh, perfect, thank you. So uh, campus swaps are much more tractable than in the vertex coloring case, in the sense that uh, campus chains will have a very um, constrained uh, structure. So what is a campus chain? First, I'm talking about campus chains for a few minutes now. The definition of, of a campus chain is, let's say I have a coloring of my graph, Sorry, I have a coloring of my graph and I will take, let's say two colors, red and blue. I will consider an edge color red or blue and I will consider the maximal bichromatic components containing this edge. So let's say here I have my edge colored red and I will look at uh, its neighbors colored blue and then the neighbors of these blue edges colored red, extra, extra, until I reach a maximal uh, bichromatic component. and. So the, the, um, uh, the definition is the same for vertex coloring, but for edge coloring, because for each vertex, you can only have one edge color blue and one edge color red incident to, uh, to this vertex. If I consider a campus chain, so maximal bichromatic component, I only have two cases in the case of edge coloring, and we'll see this on uh, this example. So let's say here I have my graph, which is already three edge colored with blue, red, and uh, green. And the two cases that I can have for a Kempe chain is either a cycle. So for example, if I consider the red-blue Kempe chain containing this edge, I have a red-blue uh, cycle. And because it's a big chromatic cycle, it is an even cycle. And this is uh, always something really um, nice to have, especially when you're working, for example, with bipartite graph uh, and Kempe swaps. So you can have a cycle and the other case is the case of a path. So I can, of course, switch this red blue into a blue red. And you can see that after the swap, I still have a proper coloring because I swap all the edges of my maximal bichromatic component. So I can have a cycle and I can also have a path. So in this case, I consider the green red path, the green red component containing this red edge. And I see that I have a path that I can swap into a green red uh, path with the same principle. And there is the last case, which is the degenerated case of the path, which is really the case that is interesting for us, is the case of a single edge. 
And this is how the proof of the vision works for, let's say, deleting some color classes. Let's say here I want in my graph to reduce the number of red edges that I have in my coloring. What I can do is to consider the red green component containing this edge. And because this edge is not adjacent to any other uh, green edge, it's alone in its component. So I can switch it somehow freely into green. And now I have a coloring with strictly, uh, strictly less uh, red edges in my graph. And the proof of using works really like this. You just take a color class and you will reduce the number of edges colored with this color class until you have no edges uh, colored with this color class. And so you have deleted a color class. You have reduced the number of colors that you're using uh, in your coloring. So um, what about this um, uh, vision conjecture that I will be uh, talking uh, about during the rest of the talk? So here we have a vision theorem, which uh, says that uh, starting from a cage coloring, you can reach a delta plus one edge coloring. And vision conjecture in one year later, then starting from a K edge coloring, actually you can reach a delta edge coloring if there is any. So if your graph is not delta edge colorable, so if it's only delta plus one edge colorable, then Vising's theorem says that you can reach an optimal coloring starting from a K edge coloring. And Vising said that uh, he conjectured that if your graph is delta colorable, then you can also reach an optimal coloring starting from any uh, K edge coloring uh, of your graph. And uh, yes, this is it, sorry. So this is a Vising's conjecture. And actually, Mohar in 2006 uh, conjectured something a bit weaker. He conjectured that all delta plus two edge colorings are equivalent. And uh, it's not something weaker. It's something kind of equivalent in the sense that if um, we'll see this on the next slide to have a, a better picture of uh, how we can prove this, but if all if my delta plus two edge colorings, oh, let me remind it in a good way. So for all the delta plus two edge colorings to be equivalent, it's not really a conjecture equivalent to Vising's uh, conjecture. This conjecture of Moore says uh, is equivalent to the following. If any delta plus two edge coloring is equivalent to any delta plus one edge coloring, so if you can choose your delta plus one edge coloring, then all your delta plus two edge colorings will be equivalent. So why is that? Let's say I have my first delta plus two edge coloring, and then I can choose a delta plus one edge coloring, which will be equivalent to my starting delta plus two edge coloring. And I will have my target delta plus two edge coloring, and I know that this target is also equivalent to my favorite delta plus one edge coloring that I've chosen in the beginning. So if I have a sequence to transform my first delta plus two into my delta plus one and my target delta plus two into my delta plus one, I just can concatenate the two sequences to get a sequence to transform my delta plus two into my other delta plus two. So this conjecture is about choosing your delta plus one edge coloring uh, to get this uh, equivalence between the two delta plus uh, delta plus two edge coverings. And so what about those two conjectures, which are kind of linked? It um, turns out that uh, they are both true. And actually, we were able to prove that all the chi prime plus one edge coverings of uh, a graph G are equivalent. And actually, this uh, theorem is just the direct consequence of the fact that any chi prime plus one edge coloring is equivalent to any chi prime edge coloring of your graph. So to prove that two chi prime plus one edge colorings are equivalent, you will choose your favorite chi prime coloring, your favorite optimal coloring. You will find a sequence from your first chi prime plus one coloring to your chi prime coloring, and a sequence from your second chi prime plus one coloring to your chi prime coloring. And you will concatenate the two sequences and you will get a sequence to transform your first chi prime plus one edge coloring into your second chi prime plus one edge coloring. 
So actually, this theorem just uh, says that both conjectures are uh, true in the sense that you can choose. So you can reach a delta edge coloring if there is any. You can reach a chi prime coloring, and you can choose your chi prime coloring. You can choose which chi prime coloring you want to reach with your uh, Kempe sequence. Just a note on the number of uh, colors. So here we are only talking about chi prime plus one coloring. And why can't we just conjecture something like, okay, if I can choose my optimal coloring, my chi prime coloring, why can't I just conjecture that, okay, all the optimal colorings are equivalent? All the chi prime colorings are equivalent. Why can't I just transform any chi prime coloring into any other chi prime coloring? And this is because uh, it was uh, remarked by uh, Vising himself, I think, that uh, you have uh, very simple graphs where you have two optimal colorings which are not equivalent. And how you, can you prove this? I'm sorry. And actually, in edge coloring or even in coloring, I don't even know any other kind of argument to show that two colorings are not equivalent. You will show that in your edge coloring, you can find, uh, I mean, you can find an edge coloring which is uh, what we call frozen. So what is a frozen coloring? It's coloring where uh, whatever pair of color you choose, if you swap a Kempe chain containing those two colors, then it won't change an invariant of the coloring, which is the partition of the edges into a stable. So you can see here uh, this on those two examples, which are K33 and K5, and which is really funny. These are the minimum size example of frozen coloring that we have for edge coloring, and also the obstruction for planarity, but I don't think that there is any uh, link between those two facts. So here on my first K33, I can see, so let's take, let's say I take the color red and green. And if I take a red green component containing this edge, it's here a Hamiltonian path. It's even a Hamiltonian cycle, sorry. So, and it contains all the edges colored green and red in my graph. So if I swap it, I just somehow just rename the color green into red and rename the color red into blue. <coughs> And, what, uh, and if I have this frozen coloring, and if I have another coloring where the partition is not the same, then I know that whatever I do, I won't be able to transform my first coloring into my other coloring. So here on the right, you can see that I have here a blue matching, and I don't have this blue matching on the left. So the two colorings have different partitions, and this one is frozen. So the two colorings are not equivalent. And this is kind of the same argument for uh, K5, which is not on delta colorable. So back to the conjecture, um, what was known about uh, these kind of problems on uh, camp equivalence of uh, near optimal colorings? So Mohar actually in his paper when he, uh, where he conjectured that delta plus two colorings are all equivalent, he proves that if you have two additional color than the optimal, then you can uh, always transform your uh, coloring to uh, your other coloring. But now, if you only have one uh, additional uh, color, so this is just the, um, this would be in, this would implies the Vising's conjecture. So, if all my chi prime plus one edge coloring were equivalent, this would uh, imply a Vising's conjecture, and this conjecture was only proven for uh, by Patchett graph. So by Yasacha in two thousand and nine. And for a graph of a small maximal degree. So it was proved for subcubic graph also by Mohar, McDonald, and Scheider. And it was proved for a graph of maximum degree four. And something like, uh, so it's written to, to 2022, but we work on this something like two years ago with Mart, Bonami, Oscar de Fran, Terka Klimoshova, and Aurélie Lagoutte. We were able to prove it for um, triangle free graphs. And I trade. The proof for the general case is just somehow the continuation of the proof for a triangle free graph with, uh, we'll see that this later, um, uh, a study of a new meta operation that we will be able to define based on our campus webs in our current. So this is uh, 
it. And now for the rest of the talk, I will be talking about the proof itself. And um, the first thing that uh, we'll uh, see is how to prove. So what I've said something like three slides ago, how to prove that two chi prime plus one carings are equivalent. So let's say I want to prove that beta one is equivalent to beta two, which means that I have here a sequence of campus swaps to transform beta one into beta two. What I will do is that I will choose my favorite uh, chi prime carring alpha, which will be somehow kind of um, uh, halfway between beta two and beta one. And I will find a sequence between beta one and alpha and a sequence between beta two and alpha. And then I will just concatenate the two sequences to find my uh, sequence to transform beta one into beta two. And to do that, the first thing that we will do and which is something I won't say standard, but I've already seen this in other proof about reconfigurations and colorings in, in general, is that we will try to regal, regularize, yes, our graphs in the sense that we will reduce the, the question to the class of graph which are chi prime regular. This means that we'll have a graph which is regular where all the vertices have the same degree and this graph will be delta colorable in the sense that uh, it won't need delta plus one colors to be colored. And why is this really nice to have a chi prime regular graph? Because of two main arguments. The first thing is that if I have a chi prime coloring of my chi prime regular graph, so each vertex will be incident to every color class. And this means that each color class in my graph will be a perfect matching because each vertex is incident to um, an edge of color red and an edge of color blue extra. So this is uh, really nice and this will uh, really helps us for the, the induction because the general principle of the proof is an induction on the chromatic index. And second thing that is really useful is that if I have one additional color, then each vertex in my coloring will somehow miss exactly one color. And this will give us a lot of uh, control on the campus swaps that we will be able to uh, apply in our coloring. So uh, how uh, does the reduction works? And actually I will show it to you uh, with this uh, small uh, example because it's really nice and easy to, to, to see. So I will build a graph starting from, this is my graph G and starting from this graph G and this coloring, this three coloring of my graph G, I will build a graph G prime, will, which will be uh, three regular and such that I will be able to complete this first uh, three coloring of my graph G into a coloring of my graph G prime. And this is done um, with an industry step, which is the following. So I have my graph G and my coloring, and I will take a copy of my graph G and I will copy the coloring. And then I will just add an edge between the vertices of minimum degree if my, in my new graph. So it gives something like this. And because I uh, use only, I add only edges between the vertices of minimum degree, I'm guaranteed that I will have an available color to color my new matching that I add at each step. So here I can choose, for example, uh, this coloring. And then I will just do the same step again to get something like this. So I take a copy, I add my matching, and now each vertex of here, each vertex of minimum degree is of degree two. So I still have one color to color the uh, remaining matching and it gives something like this. And so the particularity of this graph is two things. So first I can, starting from a, my graph G, I can complete the coloring of my graph G into a uh, coloring of my graph G prime. And second thing, which is really important for us is uh, what about uh, campus sequences between uh, those two colorings in those two graphs? And this is um, something really interesting because my graph G is an induced subgraph of my big graph G prime. I have that if I have a sequence to transform a coloring of my graph G prime into another coloring of my graph G prime, I just need to take the restriction of those sequences to my graph G to transform the corresponding colorings uh, using exactly the same sequence. 
So here, because my graph G is really small, uh, it's not that easy to see, but whenever you take an induced subgraph of a graph, and you can just take the restriction of a Kempe sequence and it will work uh, for the restriction of your two colorings on your smaller graph. So this is a single temperature in, in the larger graph it can correspond to the number of temperatures. Yes. In the graph. And the so other way around also. Yes, the number of campus swaps is not the same, but it's something like linear somehow. So uh, there is. But yes, this is really uh, why it's nice to work with the uh, Kai prime regular graph worked, uh, I mean, built this way is that if we have a sequence for our big graph, we just take the restriction and we'll have a sequence for our small graph. And this is why we can just restrict ourselves to the case of Kai prime regular graphs. And does it also work the other way around? If you have uh, two colorings of a small graph and a sequence between them, can you produce corresponding two colorings of the larger graph and the sequence between them? Can you complete uh, the sequence uh, for the big graphs? I don't think so. Uh, in the sense, see, if I take, for example, uh, my two frozen colorings that I have here, uh yes so for example i take um only just those two edges as an induced subgraph of uh, no. no but i mean in that construction ah in that construction mm -hmm. i don't think so i don't have any definitive argument now but i don't think so i'll think about it i think the answer is no So now we have our regular graph. We're uh, really happy because everybody sees uh, exactly three neighbors here. So everybody will have the good delta. And we'll see how um, the induction on the chromatic index will work in the next slides. So remember that what we need, so here I have uh, the example that I will be showing you the, the induction. What we need is to transform our chi prime plus one coloring beta, which we are given in the beginning, into our favorite chi prime coloring alpha. So here on this example, I have uh, on the left a coloring with four colors, and here on the right a coloring with three colors. And my uh, goal in life is to find a sequence to transform this one into this one. And if, if I have this, then I can conclude uh, with the proof. So how does it work? I will. I won't do this uh, like in a very complicated way. I will just do it color classes after color classes. And why am I happy is that in a chi prime coloring, each color class is a perfect matching. So here, for example, I will consider the color red on the left, on the right, sorry. And this color is a perfect matching. And I will look at those edges from this perfect matching what is their color in my uh, non-optimal coloring beta? So I will put them in bold and I will zoom on my uh, non-optimal coloring beta. And now for those edges in this matching, I can define three types of edges. So here, my goal is to color all these edges in this matching into the color red, such so that the two colorings will correspond on the color class red and I will be happy and I will be able to, to do my induction. So here I have edges in my coloring beta, which are already color red. So I'm happy with them. And I will call those edges my good edges. But I also have edges which are color red in alpha, but which are not color red in beta. So for example, they are called purple or yellow or blue. And I will call those edges my bad edges. And I, my goal will be to find a sequence of campus swaps to transform those edges into something like red. And the third and uh, last type of edges are uh, the ugly edges, which are edges which are not color red in my optimal coloring, but which are color red in uh, my coloring beta. And so my goal is to transform the color of those edges into something else than red. And what is important here is that we don't really need to give those edges their definitive color because we only care about the color red in this step of the proof. 
we have the freedom to color them uh, from a really random color and we will be happy in the sense that we only care about the uh, red edges and the red color in our graph. So how uh, will uh, we do that? Actually using Kempe swap. So here on this example, it's really simple to transform any uh, edges in bold into something red using Kempe swaps. For example, I will consider the Kempe chain. So the Kempe components, the purple red Kempe component containing the three edges, it's a path that I can swap. And then after the swap, what I get is two additional good edges and one less, uh, one fewer uh, bad edge. So I'm happy. I'm kind of at each step reducing the symmetric difference on this uh, very specific color class that I'm considering. And this is what I will do for uh, the rest of the proof. I will take something like this campus chain, I will swap it, and then I just have this bad edge that I can swap into a good edge. And when all the edges of my matching are good, then I don't have any other bad edges or ugly edges. So what I can do now, I know that those red edges are also a perfect matching in my non-optimal coloring because the two colorings correspond on, uh, on this matching. So what I can do is just delete all the edges of the matching. And what I get is a graph, which is also regular, which so you just let you rely on the fact that the target coloring is a perfect matching. Yes. Otherwise, it, you wouldn't be able to make an improvement. Exactly. Uh, so exactly. It's yes. yes, it's really the crucial part is that uh, we guess uh, an optimal coloring. In an optimal coloring, every color class is a perfect matching. So we will make the two colorings correspond on this perfect matching. We will remove the perfect matching and uh, and have an induction on the chromatic index on our graph. So here we have uh, every degree, uh, every root axis of degree two. And this graph is a two edge colorable. So I have reduced my chromatic index and my, uh, and my maximum degree. I have a, a, a two regular graph, which is two colorable. So from the way you only do the spots on the red, or do you have to do some other? We'll see this later, but you will have to do a lot of campus swaps on other colors and maybe some campus swaps which change something very far away in your, in your graph. Then you will do a very single campus change on a red edge, and then you will have to repair the things that you have done before. But once you forget about red edges, you will not use red anymore. Exactly. And this is why you are guaranteed that the red edges will remain the same until uh, the end of the process. So this is the general induction of the proof. And what, um, where I've been lying to you, showing you this very simple example is that we won't be able to do these very simple campus swaps that we've done on uh, our uh, example, this a kind of three edges or two edges campus swaps. And how we'll be able, to, actually what we need is a very strict control of what we are doing in our coloring because we, uh, when we are considering a campus chain because it's a maximal bichromatic component, it can really spread all around your graph and it can change a lot of things. So you need a lot of control on your campus swaps to be able to guarantee that, um, Somehow you're not breaking things anywhere else in your coloring. And so we'll see this on uh, this second example, which is the tool invented by Vizing himself in his proof to prove that you can reach a delta plus one coloring. Because in his proof, he, he doesn't just do very large campus swaps, uh, which spreads all around the graph. He has a really strict control on what he's doing. And especially he's not always, but often doing only single edges campus swaps around a single vertex. We'll see this on this example. So let's say here I have a red edge. So a red for me would be color one, let's say. Uh, incident with a vertex V, which let's say is missing the color seven. So it's missing a color. We are in a chi prime plus one coloring. And our goal uh, will be to do some campus swap on this edge, let's say. 
but we don't want that this campus swap just break uh, things uh, anywhere else in our graph. We want to be sure that we only change edges that we want. So what we will do is that we will look at the missing color at this vertex, the neighbor of V. And let's say this missing color is the color two. So what we'll do we, next will be we are going to look at the edge colored two incidents with the vertex V. And we will just repeat the process. So we will look at the uh, missing color at this vertex, let's say three. And so we'll look at the edge color three around uh, V and we will continue this process until we reach an end. And here on this example, you can see that the process ends when this neighbor of V is missing the exact same color as V. It's missing the color seven. And now we are really happy. Why? Because our goal was to recolor this edge, let's say colored one. Let's say that this edge was an ugly edge. We want to recolor it into something else than one. We don't really care about the color for this example. So we want to recolor it into the color, uh, into anything else than one, but we want to be sure that we won't change the color on, of any other red edges in our graph in order not to lose any good edges in our coloring. And what we, what we will do is that we will just use a sequence of single edge uh, campus swaps to do that. So here, because two adjacent vertices are missing the color seven, it means that there is no edge colored seven around V or around this neighbor of V. So I can freely recolor this edge six into uh, an edge colored seven. And when I do this, I also change the missing color at V and its neighbor, and it's now six. But six was also the missing color of this uh, neighbor of V. So I can just propagate this uh, kind of single edge campus swaps in this way, such that in the end, I get something where V is missing the same color as the first neighbor of V that we've looked at. And so we know that we can recolor this edge red into two with a single edge campus swap and not propagate uh, the campus swap in the rest of our coloring. So here, what we've done with this, um, so this structure actually is called a vising fan. And what we've done here is what we called a fan inversion. We've just uh, inverted, somehow recolored the first edges, the first edge that we've considered into something else than one without breaking anything else colored one in our graph. And here we are really happy because we are sure that we are reducing the symmetry difference uh, in our coloring. So this is one type of fan. And as we saw, we saw that this type of fan, which are uh, called path shapes in the sense that if you look at here, the sequence that you have at some point, you're stopping like a directed path, you can invert uh, this kind of path in a very simple way with single edges uh, can be swap. But there are two other types of um, of fans. So at some point in your process, you can uh, find a neighbor of V, which is missing the color of the first edge that you've considered. And this fan are called, those fans are called cycles. Or at some point you can find a missing color here that, you already, uh, that you've already encountered during your process. And you have something like a path, which is coming back to one of its internal vertex. And we call those fans uh, comets. And this, this will be the, the tools that we will use to recolor our, uh, the edges of our graph in a very controlled way to make our symmetry difference decrease. So we've seen that uh, paths are invertible with a very, let's say, simple uh, sequence of uh, single edge swaps. And if we are considering comets, then we can almost invert them. Actually, there are two different cases that you can consider that you can have in your graph. And why do you just almost invert them? Is that at some point for comets, you will have to do some campus swaps that will propagate in your coloring, that will break things. But those campus swaps won't break things involving color one. Because you're only considering color one, you're happy. Actually, you can have something like a seven three that you can that you need to do to invert your comets to recolor 
your first stage into something else than one, but you don't really care about the color seven and the color three because you will take care of them afterwards. So uh, we have the solution for paths, we have the solution for comets, and actually those two cases are almost sufficient to handle the triangle three case, actually. To handle the triangle three case, I'm a bit lying, you need to handle also a simple case of uh, cycles. But now the real uh, thing to um, pass from the triangle three case to the general case is to take care of cycles. And this is, let's say the, the main part of the remaining of the proof is how to invert a cycle, how to find the sequence of campus swap to make your cycle turning in this uh, counterclockwise uh, direction into a cycle turning in the other direction without breaking anything else in your graph. So what about cycles? And actually uh, this is the main technical lemma of the uh, theorem. If you take any chi prime plus one coring of a chi prime regular graph, then any cycle is invertible in the sense that you will find a sequence of campus swaps to transform your cycle turning this way into a cycle turning the other way. So the cycle will involve the same set of colors. The missing color in the center of your cycle will remain the same, but the cycle will turn uh, the other way around. You are allowed to change colors different than one. Yes, exactly. So from now on, we can, in a way, forget about uh, the good edges, bad edges, ugly edges. The rest of the proof is just proving that a certain meta operation is doable in a chi prime plus one coloring. So at the beginning, we had only one operation, which was campus swaps. Then we saw that we could also have this kind of meta operation, which is called a path inversion. So you have a fan, which is a path, and you invert it with a sequence of single edge campus swaps. And now to prove that you can always reduce the number of good edges, you need to prove that you can do another, a third type of operation, which is the operation cycle inversion. And this is sufficient to prove that you can always reduce uh, the symmetric difference between the two colorings. So how uh, will we uh, do that? Actually, this is really, uh, this, the rest of the proof is really technical. So I will just give you some kind of glimpse of how things work and maybe the flavor on how the, the lemmas work. Actually, the thing is always the same. We want to find a sequence of campus swaps to invert our cycle without touching anything around. So um, the general outline of the proof is an induction of the size of the cycle. So we'll consider a minimum cycle, a cycle which is not invertible um, of minimum size. This means that any cycle which is smaller will be invertible. It means that I can find a sequence of coloring to invert my cycle. And we start by saying that cycles of uh, size two are actually really simple. Uh, they are just uh, two edges uh, can be chain. Because here, if I look at, let's say my edge colored one, I have here uh, missing two. So I have an edge color two. If, if my cycle is of size two, I need to have uh, my vertex here, which is missing one. So if I just do a, a campus swap, a red blue campus swap on those two edges, I can somehow invert my uh, size two cycle. So now I, I know that I have a cycle of size. So, so what does it really mean to invert a cycle? To invert a cycle, let me find. So inversing a cycle more formally is to find a coloring where for any edges which are not part of my cycle, the color is the same. But for the edges of my cycle, each edge here will be colored with the missing color of this neighbor. And each neighbor here will be missing the color of this edge. And this, yes, sorry, maybe, maybe I wasn't clear enough. 
And this will, if you do the same drawing with this um, coloring, so this uh, vertex will be missing six and this edge will be colored one, this edge will be colored two and this vertex will be missing one extra. You will see that if you uh, draw the, uh, uh, the arrows like this, you will have that your cycle is turning uh, the, uh, in the other direction. So the, yes, this is what is inverting the cycle. Finding a coloring where everything is the same, except this cycle where each edge is colored with the missing color of the neighbors in the original coloring. Is it okay for uh, everyone? Just coming back to the comets. Yes. There was a change on the side. So for the comets, actually, uh, some different. For the comets, it was changed in color seven and three, so you allow yes to change outside. Now it's not going to be case. Yes, exactly. Now what we want is to uh, now what we want is to somehow the the proof works like this. If I want to reduce my symmetry difference, I need uh, the path inversion operation, the comets almost inversion operation. And I also need the cycle inversion operation. I won't get into many details, so you have to believe me on this. But if you have those three operations, then you're able to reduce the symmetric difference between the two colorings. And to show that you can have these three operations, you need to show this, uh, let's say, lemma, which only uh, talk about reconfiguration. Somehow we need to prove that this operation is always possible. And this operation really means not touching anything around and just changing the colors of your edges in your cycle. Yeah. So we have this induction and now uh, the general outline uh, of the proof to prove that you have uh, that you can always invert your cycle is the, the following. Actually, this is, uh, I think, really uh, nice because the, the, the principle, I mean, you will see this. Just so let's say I want, I have a coloring and I have, let's say, a cycle here around this vertex. And what I will say is that if my cycle is not invertible, then actually my vertex here, so this is the neighboring of my vertex, the neighborhood, sorry, of my vertex. If I have a cycle which is not invertible around this vertex, it means that actually the neighborhood of my vertex is a clique. It means that really I have an edge between each uh, neighbor of uh, my vertex V. And moreover, it also means that, so because my graph is regular, here, the neighborhood uh, of my vertex is my uh, whole graph because uh, it's a clique. And moreover, I have that if I have a non-invertible cycle around this vertex, each neighbor of my vertex will be missing a different color. And my vertex will also be missing a different color. And why is it useful? We can almost conclude here. If we have this kind of situation, Remember that we have a chi prime regular graph and our graph is a clique. And actually, uh, this means that uh, our graph is an even clique because odd cliques are not uh, chi prime, uh, sorry, are not delta uh, colorable. You can see this pretty easily because if you have, so you have an odd clique, if you have delta colors, each color class can only touch n minus one over two edges. And so if you only have n minus one colors, so delta colors, you can only cover with your coloring n minus one squares over two colors. So you lack one color class to finish your colorings. If you have delta plus one colors in the coloring of an off click, you have n colors and each color class can cover also n minus one over two uh, edges, so you can cover all the edges of your clique. So up clicks are not delta colorable. Actually, even clicks are uh, delta colorable, but this is a really not trivial. This is the consequence of a result on hypergraph, but we don't really need this to complete the proof. 
We have an even click. It's uh, missing a different color on each of the vertices. And just by a simple uh, counting argument, we reach a contradiction because if we have, so we have here a delta plus one coloring of an even click. And in any delta plus one coloring of an even click, for each color class, the number of vertices which is missing this color must always be even because, uh, because each, uh, yes, each color class will only cover an even number of vertices. So the vertices missing this color will also be even because we have an even number of vertices in total. So here we have a contradiction because each for each color, there is only one vertex missing this color. So this is not possible. And this is uh, the, the general uh, principle of the proof. We need two things. We need to prove that first, we have uh, edges between each neighbor of our central vertex V, where there is an in, a non-invertible cycle around. And we need a second thing. We need to prove that each neighbor of V is also missing a different color. And this color is also different from the missing color. And with these two things, we can conclude the proof. So uh, this is uh, what is said in this uh, slide. And then maybe I will be yes, a bit quicker on this, actually. So to prove that uh, each vertex is missing a different color, we will use the fact that in a cycle, each vertex is missing a different color. So we will show that any fan around V is a cycle somehow. And then to show that we have edges between the uh, neighbors of V, we will uh, we'll use the notion of uh, entangleness. And actually, if I take two fans, which are sharing a color, let's say they are sharing the color one, it means that they both have a vertex missing one in their uh, structure, and they are entangled if this vertex missing one is the same. And with this notion of entangleness, we'll be able to guarantee that we have edges between uh, the neighbors of uh, our uh, central vertex V. And we'll see this on a few examples. So if it's not the case, we have that V is not uh, invertible. So as I said, the principle will be something like this. We will have our non-invertible cycle, which is of minimum size, and we will find a sequence to invert it to show that if this configuration happens, then I can invert my cycle. So I have a contradiction. Thus, this, this, con this configuration cannot happen uh, around a minimum uh, non-invertible cycle. So what I will do is that I will just break things with Kempe swaps to somehow unlock uh, my cycle. I will invert the cycle. And then, because I really need that this operation is really clean and doesn't change anything else in my graph, I will have to repair what I've done in the first operation. And this is really uh, the, let's say, annoying part of uh, the rest of the proof, which is, say, pretty technical in the sense that you really have a case analysis of what happened if the color three and the color seven is touching on this vertex. And how can I just repair what I've done to uh, invert my cycle? And so for this, we'll have uh, the three operations, which are a simple campus swaps, which what we've so uh, in the beginning, we have this uh, pass inversion. So we are inverting a fan, which is a path. And we have the last operation because we're considering a minimum non-invertible cycle. We know that any cycle which is smaller will be invertible. And inverting a cycle really means not changing anything else in the graph. So uh, in the rest of the proof, if I have some time, I'm uh, going to show you some kind of properties that you can show on your non-invertible cycle and how you can uh, make those edges appear somehow between the neighbors of V. So the first thing that you can show and to illustrate the, uh, this principle of uh, making a, doing a campus swap to unlock, inverting, and then repairing. Here, let's say we have this cycle around this vertex missing color one. So here I have a red edge here missing two blue, blue, green, green, purple, etc. until I reach 
here uh, missing eight, which correspond to the color red. And I will look at um, uh, the Kempe chain containing this vertex, this uh, vertex missing the color green, so three. And as another color, we will choose the missing color of the central vertex. So a one, three Kempe chain containing this vertex. And what happened if this Kempe chain here, so the green purple Kempe chain, doesn't touch the central vertex? What I can do is that I can swap it, let's say. So I use uh, here a Kempe swap, which is a path to change the missing color of this vertex without touching the missing color of this vertex. And this, uh, and now what we have is that the two, nay, uh, the two uh, vertices are missing the same color. So what I have here, if I look at the fan starting with these green edges, so three, four, four, five, et cetera, I have a fan, which is a path. So I can use my pass inversion operation in this way. So sorry for the jumping pictures, but you have just the sequence of single edge campus swap. And now the coring, in the coring that you have after the single edges campus swap, you have that this edge, this dark purple edge, it's colored one. So now the Kempe component, com the green dark purple Kempe component containing this vertex is the component that we swapped in the first step plus this edge. And now this vertex is missing the color three. So the Kempe component stops here and we can swap back our first Kempe component to get a coloring where this edge is colored green. And if I just put the two colorings and just uh, uh, here, we can see that in the final coloring, what we got is the invert of our first uh, cycle. So here the edge is colored uh, uh, red, sorry. Red means eight. And we see that here, this vertex is missing eight and here it's missing eight and here it's colored red and the central vertex is missing the same color. And we haven't changed anything else in the rest of our graph. And so this is the, the kind of thing that you can say about your non invertible cycles. First, you can lock the situation with a Kempe chains. So it means that this first Kempe chain cannot happen like this. It has to come back somehow to this vertex missing one. So it has to uh, go something like this. So the three one Kempe chain containing this vertex is doing something in my graph, I don't know what, but at some point it's just coming back here and touching this central vertex. So that when I swap this uh, Kempe chain, I will change the missing color of this vertex and this vertex. And I have this for one three, but I have this also for any other color in my uh, cycle, which means that I have something like this and so um, we can say that our cycles are saturated and this is really how the proofs works you're going to put some constraints on the this kind of color system around your uh, cycle to show that if your cycle is not invertible then my Kempe chain has to go like this uh, just maybe very quickly another example is about the tightness now we are looking at Kempe swaps involving two consecutive colors in my cycle, so three and four, and the same principle. Uh, if I have this Kempe swap, uh, this Kempe chain, which is not touching this vertex missing four, then I can invert my cycle. How can I do that really quickly? I do my Kempe swap to unlock, uh, in some sense, my cycle. And what I have now, so you can see that I've uh, it's, uh, erased this edge, because if you look at the other edges, we now have a strictly smaller cycle. So here I start with purple five, then pink six. Uh, here I have blue seven, here green eight, red two and blue four. And then I come back to this edge. So here I have a cycle with one less edge. It's smaller, so I can invert it uh, with my induction hypothesis. And what I get, is something like this. So the missing colors and the 
color of the edge has just been swapped in, uh, in this cycle inversion. And now I need to repair what I've done. And to repair it, I'm really happy because here my green, uh, let's say, light purple uh, three, four can pay swaps. The can pay chain is that I've swapped is this one plus this edge colored uh, purple plus this edge colored green. And because this vertex is missing the color four, it stops here. So I know that I can just swap it and it will stop here. And I will have repaired what I've done in my first step and unchanged uh, the colors of the edges in my cycle. And so you can see that uh, on the same principle, I can invert my cycle. So I don't have this kind of situation. So I have something like this, where for any pair of two consecutive colors in my cycle, I have uh, also this kind of system. And I will go really quickly for the third thing, but because I've done the animation, I'm pretty happy with <laughs> to show it to you. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, the third, uh, the last thing is how to somehow show that we have edges between the neighbors of uh, our uh, central vertex here, V. We will consider the fans starting at the neighbors of V. So let's say I consider a fan starting here at this neighbor missing four, starting with this edge colored red, so colored eight. And I will look at the form of my fan. And let's say that my fan is a, a path. So I don't really care about the colors that I will have here. I know that I just have a sequence of colors which uh, ends with something like this vertex missing the same color as this vertex. So I have a fan, which is a path. I know that I have my path inversion operation. I know that my cycle is tight. So I will show you the sequence to invert uh, my cycle really quickly. I will invert this path. And now what I have is a smaller cycle on the left that I can invert. And now what I have is that this Kempe chain is now a cycle, an even cycle like this. So purple, green, I can swap it. So I have now a green purple, but now this is another smaller cycle that I can also invert by induction. And what I get uh, now is uh, my Kempe swaps is uh, going like this through this edge and through this green edge. So now I need to invert back the first path that I've uh, inverted in my sequence to make the Kempe component stop here. And so now I can just swap it back to get exactly uh, the invert of V. So this is really the principle of the proof. We'll take a neighbor of V, we'll take a color, we'll look at the fan, uh, which is uh, starting with this color. And we'll show that if this fan is not a cycle, then my first minimum cycle is invertible. So here is the case for the best, a really simple case. So actually, you will prove that this fan is a cycle. And you will show that, moreover, this fan is a cycle. So there is a vertex missing a color 8 here. But you will show that this cycle is entangled with your first minimum cycle. So actually, this vertex is exactly the same as this vertex. And so you know that this edge here is actually an edge between this neighbor missing four and this neighbor missing eight. So this is kind of what we do in the proof. We find this kind of sequence by just taking a vertex, taking a color, looking at the fan, showing that if the fan is a path, we can invert our first cycle. And if not, it means that uh, we have uh, an edge between two neighbors of V. And this is actually how uh, the remaining of the proof works. It's somehow a quite long case analysis on how uh, the fans around the neighbors of, of V behave somehow. So this is it for the proof and sorry for uh, hammering you with this uh, reconfiguration sequence, but I, I hope that you've uh, got something from it. What about the future questions that are linked with this uh, edge car new configuration? So I've told you in the beginning that this improved it, proof his theorem for multigraphs, just taking into account the multiplicity of uh, your multigraph. So can we, also uh, generalize this reconfiguration uh, theorem 
four multigraphs. And actually, we've tried a bit to work on this question, but everything seemed to break down really quickly in the sense that when you have, sorry, when you have a multigraph, you can have somewhat comets. In a comet, in a simple graph, you know that you have two vertices which are missing the same color. In a comet, in a multigraph, you can have only one vertex missing this color. In a multigraph, even a comet can be like this. Each vertex is missing a different color. So we are not really able to adapt our proof uh, to multigraph, even uh, the very first steps of the proof. So for multigraph, we really have to do something else. And just a word about the list version. So for list edge coloring, you just put a list on the edges, which are the available colors for these edges. And you can also define a Kempe swap for list coloring, which is just, uh, I consider the list and I can, uh, a Kempe swap is doable only if all the edges involved in the Kempe swap have the other color in their list. So they are generalization of vertex coloring reconfiguration results for list coloring. So maybe this can be something, but speaking about uh, list edge coloring, there is a very nice conjecture on uh, list edge coloring, which is called the list edge coloring conjecture, which says that uh, giving lists to your edges or just giving them the same set of color doesn't change anything for the number of colors that you need. And um, what is really interesting about this conjecture, we, we don't know a lot of things about this conjecture. We know it for that it's true for bipartite graph. We know it also for cliques of odd degree where the degree is prime or, I mean, uh, there are not a lot of cases when we know where that this conjecture is true, but uh, last year, uh, Ozeki, proved that the conjecture is true for uh, some subclass of subcubic graph. And actually what he uses uh, to prove it is, is that he proves that for this class of subcubic graphs, all the optimal colorings are Kempe equivalent. And with a lemma from Allen, you can conclude that uh, your graph is also uh, three least colorable. So if all your optimal colorings are equivalent in a cubic graph, uh, then you can say that, uh, so yes, it's not subcubic, it's cubic graph, sorry. So you can say that your graph is also chi prime choosable. So the uh, very nice thing that I would, sorry, that I would like to do is how can we somehow use this result on reconfiguration of chi prime plus one colorings to find a way to prove that other classes of graph are also good for uh, the least edge coloring conjecture. And this is all for me. Thank you. Thank you.